Hello, David and Johan. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, hello, Tim and Johan. Nice to see you both. Great. Well, I'm excited to talk to both of you today, and I'm so excited that we've come together to discuss your recent article, David, in Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice, your article titled, Democracy Needs Entrepreneurship, and Entrepreneurship Needs Democracy. I want to go ahead and read an abstract from the paper, and then we can dive into it and, and start to, to talk about this fascinating topic and theory. David, from your paper, you say entrepreneurship has been claimed to matter and deserve priority because it's been linked to some of the most compelling economic and social issues of our time. This paper suggests that entrepreneurship is also inextricably linked to a fundamental value common among the Western developed economies, democracy. Three distinct contexts are examined to link democracy to entrepreneurship, two historical, and one contemporary. The first is national socialism in Germany, which emerged by suppressing both entrepreneurship and democracy. The second is the rise of trusts or dominant large corporations and concomitant decline of small business in the United States at the end of the 19th century. Finally, both measurement and perception suggest a decline in democracy as well as entrepreneurship in the contemporary era. These concerns are only exacerbated in the current COVID-19 crisis. Your paper concludes that an important policy mandate for entrepreneurship may be to ensure the independent, decentralized, and autonomous decision-making serving as a cornerstone of democracy. So, David, tell us, what about this relationship between democracy and entrepreneurship, and why do they need one another? Well, first of all, thanks very much, Tim, for uh, uh, organizing and, and bringing uh, my old friend Johan uh, and myself together to, uh, to discuss this, this uh, really important issue. Uh, uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, democracy and entrepreneurship. You know, it takes me back to uh, uh, the night, the evening of November 9th, 1989. I was working in Berlin. And of course, that's the night the Berlin Wall fell. And there was this sense of euphoria, of just joy, not just by myself or the Berliners, but actually everybody pretty much in the world, because we could feel uh, this was the end of something and what that something was, was articulated and celebrated in a best-selling book written just a year or two later by a um, political scientist, I believe, at Johns Hopkins University, Francis Fukuyama. It became a bestseller every place. The End of History. Kind of a strange title, right? You think, what does that mean? Well, what he meant was for years, for decades, there had been this dialectic tension between certainly it peaked in the Cold War between collectivism, communism, totalitarianism, authoritarianism on the one hand, and then democracy, decentralization, uh, autonomy, freedom on the other hand. And that tension had gone back and forth, certainly in the Cold War of, of my youth, I remember that. Well, that night when the Berlin Wall fell, November night, uh, people knew immediately it's over. So what Fukuyama described is, it's the end of history in the sense of one side had prevailed democracy, democracy and the other side had become clear, totalitarianism, authoritarianism, it was over, it disappeared. So it's, so, you know, it didn't seem to tell you the truth um, as Johan was doing his PhD a little after that, I believe, and uh, kind of moving into the century, people didn't, I didn't think about uh, democracy needed entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship being needing democracy, because democracy was just a given, at least in the West, in Europe, North America, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Japan, and so on, uh, the leading countries. And it was just assumed. So it came as kind of a shock. Uh, starting, it started slowly actually uh, 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 
it, it turns out there's a systematic measurement by uh, an institution started after World War II, Freedom House, it's called. It's a nonprofit that measures, monitors democracy around the world. But then also other uh, uh, independent uh, uh, measurement of democracy, ones by the Economist Intelligence Unit, there's others as well, they all show the same thing. Since about 2004, pretty early in the century, democracy's been in decline, not just in one country, but not in all countries, but in many, many countries. And so it kind of came as a shock to realize just a couple of years ago, actually, uh, of course, in this country, it started to creep up into the media, onto the, uh, 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 you know, we'd hear it in the, 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 the news programs, you know, what's going on with democracy? It seems to be threatened. And uh, it, it kind of took us by surprise. But as we started to reflect, we knew, as you said, reading the abstract, there's also been this surprising decline of entrepreneurship measured in lots of different ways, not by me, but by a broad spectrum of different scholars, different academic fields, different research traditions. And they pretty much show the same thing, in, certainly in the United States, but also in many European OECD countries, entrepreneurship rates have been declining. And it hasn't gotten that much attention, I think, just like democracy, because you know we both assumed these are vital and they're thriving. But in the articles, we start to look is in these historical contexts you mentioned, we can see uh, uh, once there's a, a, a grab for authoritarianism, totalitarianism, like by the National Socialist Adolf Hitler in the um, uh, in the, the the Third Reich in the 1930s, you know, people typically assume that the first thing Hitler did after he actually was elected in a democratic, right, in a, but a very weak democracy, a declining democracy of the Weimar Republic that elected him. Uh, well, they, they assume the first thing he did was to liquidate the Jewish people and burn the books. No, that came, that happened, but it came later. One of the first things he did was to enact a series of policies, strange to think of his policies, but laws, statutes to eradicate small business and eliminate startups. Uh, entrepreneurial activity. He cartelized the industry so that he could control it, the National Socialist control it. We see other historical episodes. And then we know, as I mentioned, uh, certainly in the COVID era, we can see in many countries, uh, uh, we can see a curtailment of democratic processes, uh, partly in the fight for COVID. And we can see small business entrepreneurship struggling in the pandemic, but it happened before. So that's why we think the two are connected. Yeah, I mean, what I really like about David's article is that it's so it, it's very broad and suggestive. I mean, first of all, as, as you mentioned, too, it, it talks about these different uh, historical uh, episodes and, and, and what happened and, and how they're linked. But it's also very broad in terms of just, you know, throwing these broad concepts, democracy, entrepreneurship in, in, in the broadest terms on the table and saying, well, look at these things, they seem to be related. So, I mean, it, it's not a it's not an article that, that really provides any definite answers as to why and how are these linked. So I, I see this more as a, as a beginning of an area of research where we can do a lot more just by saying, look, they, they seem to be related. It's too early to say exactly how and why, but it's really important that we we try to figure this out because you know uh, what can be more important than democracy, and we have also seen in recent times both uh, in Europe and in the U.S. that not everybody is a firm believer in in democracy as we're used to knowing it, and uh, that can ha have very large implications, of course. So I think that's that's important. I also think it's it's interesting that I think that for for a long time, we have viewed entrepreneurship very much in, in terms of economics, you know, and economic outcomes such as, you know, how does entrepreneurship contribute to economic growth in a country or how does it contribute to creation of new jobs and stuff? I think it, it's healthy to, to start thinking about 
entrepreneurship in, in other ways, because it's so important both to society and to individuals. And that does, for example, I personally think it's really interesting to think about what entrepreneurship can do for entrepreneurs in terms of, you know, uh, potentially creating a better life, both for people in, in the poor world and, and also here in the United States. And then, of course, like in, in the case of David, bringing, bringing up the, its link to democracy. So I, I hope others follow. I hope, first of all, I hope people read this article and, and get inspired to see how they can help contribute to this area, but also more generally get inspired to look at these important questions and why life and how entrepreneurship can be linked. Tim, do you mind if I was jump in to uh, what Johan said? Please. Uh, you know, Johan, you really spark something, uh, a thought that I, it hadn't occurred to me. Uh, uh, is it too late to uh, revise the article, Johan? I guess it probably <laughs> And <laughs> That's the way life goes, right? Is it too late to go back to high school? But- um, You can always write another one. <laughs> that's the answer, <laughs> write another. But you know, there was a famous book um, uh, that really captured the, uh, in German, they say that zeitgeist, the, the, the mood of the moment of the late 50s, early 60s, called The Corporation Man by William H. White. It was a bestseller in America, worldwide. And it, it analyzed, depicted, portrayed what the, at that point, corporations, what it meant to work in them. And above anything, it meant obedience, uh, subjugating, yeah. autonomy, independent decision making. And I had thought about this because when I read the book a million years ago, you know what? But White's concern is what impact is this going to have on American democracy and culture when you've got these people who are now being shaped and conditioned to conform? So, really, what Johan just told us is. What entrepreneurship gives us is it doesn't matter which historical context you're now, it it people develop the discipline, the habit, the instinct of thinking for themselves, acting for themselves, being uh, autonomous. That's the core of entrepreneurship. It's the antithesis to this portrayal of the corporation man by William White. But we also know that is the, you know, in the article. Uh, it was my co-author Petra made us quote um, uh, the famous French scholar de Tocqueville came to the U.S. in the early 1800s. I know Johan loves this quote as 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 um, <laughs> Petra does, and he says, you know, because like he's observing this startup, you know, startup nation, but it wasn't Israel; it was the United States back then, right? And he goes, he goes, what amazes me is not the uh, is not the a uh, uh, magnitude of large undertakings, but the preponderance of small undertakings. Well, that's the way people talk by back then, I guess. But you know, it, it it he felt that was the the backbone of American democracy was we had this decentralized, autonomous decision making where people. Yeah, you want to jump in? Yeah. No, no. Let me pick up on that because I I completely agree. I mean, I think that it's important to realize. And I think that's what you're saying, David, how intimately entrepreneurship is linked to diversity. I mean, and yeah. you have that in, in, I would say, in two primary ways. And of course, which also helps with, with, with democracy. So you have it in terms of, you know, um, entrepreneurs provided a market with different new products and services, right? So it cr creates diversity in the marketplace. But it's also the fact that it, it, it attracts a diverse group of people. Entrepreneurship is particularly attractive to people who have a hard time fitting in the regular labor market. And I'm thinking in particular about people with disability. We know that in America, people with disability are twice as likely to operate their own business as people without a disability. And of course, it's because if you have, whether that's a mental, a psychological, or a physiological disability, you know, there are very few jobs that are adapted to, to, to your uh, capabilities. Whereas if you start your own business, you can then actually adapt your works so you can, you can make the most of who you are. And also the same thing uh, uh, with recent immigrants, for example. Uh, we know they're attracted to entrepreneurship. If, if you don't speak the language, you know, uh, it can be hard to get a regular job. So, 
so I think that aspect, uh, like you said, if that's extremely important. And it's also important uh, in terms of democracy, because if you think about it, these people with disabilities, recent immigrants and other, other uh, uh, groups that have a poor standing in society, they have a hard time accessing society and making their voices heard. You know, which is, of course, what democracy is, right? Everybody is a, it should be allowed to be heard. And entrepreneurship can be that vehicle for them to, to get access and to, to make themselves heard, you know? So I think that's a very important aspect of, of the whole link between that, That's a great and point, Johan. Yeah, it's a really great point. Yes, a great point, uh, Johan. And, and I would, David and I spoke of this earlier today. I feel like democracy and entrepreneurship, right? It allows for participation. Yes. And, and that speaks to what you're bringing up, Johan. And, and so if this, um, if you two and your colleagues start to measure the eligibility factor, uh, that's pretty exciting because I think it only fosters this theory that the two democracy and entrepreneurship are inextricably linked as David wrote. Thank you both. I uh, appreciate that very much. So, when I had read in Freedom House, uh, I think it would be great for you, David and Johan, to speak to the democracy gap and the shifting international balance, right? So in 2020, the number of free countries in the world reached its lowest level since the beginning of a 15-year decline, while the number of non-free countries reached its highest level. Love to hear your thoughts about that. Please, David. <laughs> oh, please, Johan. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I, I have to admit I'm not an expert in, in democracy per se. So it's, it's, it's uh, of course, a, a, as a member of a free society, uh, it's, it's deeply concerning, of course, to see that, um, that this is happening around the world. I'm just going to, I'm going to just give one reflection based on, you know, uh, the entrepreneurship angle. I think it's really interesting. We, we talk a lot about China and I, you know, uh, we just saw that the European Union is now going to take action to restrict uh, the, the extent to which Chinese, uh, China can invest uh, into Europe. And we know what's happening here in the US as well with the similar uh, policies to try to limit the potential influence of China. And I think we're, uh, there's a, a certain level of, of um, fear about the development and the success of China. And I think it's really interesting in terms of, personally, I believe that this model we have here in the US with the diversity and the, all the different kinds of, of um, uh, companies that are allowed to be started. Uh, I think in the long run, that is a much more robust development. I just checked recently, we can see that new firm formation rates are almost three times as high in America compared to China. They're twice as high in Canada compared to China. So, so, so what I try to say with that is, is that, you know, in, in China, I'm sure that the government does not want any crazy person out in the middle of nowhere to come up with new ideas that the government can't control. So, so, so I mean, I, I can see that, okay, we're seeing a negative development. There are more and more countries where democracy is turning down. But I think that for, if nothing else, for reasons of economic development, I think we will see that shift where, where we can see that with more people being allowed to exercise their autonomy and come up with whatever ideas they want, that's gonna spur uh, evolution. So that's, my, that's my, my, short, my short reflection on that thing. David, please. No, no, that's a really, really, uh... Good, good point, Johan, and it makes me think, you know, it makes me think one thing you, know, you, Tim, and you, Johan, and I can agree on is that health is not something we can assume at our age. We have to work for it. We have to uh, uh, be disciplined, and we have to proactively do things. Uh, some people eat an apple a day, for example, right, for health. They, but, you know, and we know when, 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 you know, with our children, they tend to assume it's there because they're young. Well, you know what? This is actually in the article. And it goes back to, it's, it's that episode in the 1800s in the United States 
because uh, there were lots of, uh, at that point, there was a small and di dispersed uh, of firms were basically tiny and small villages, small town. And what we observe, and it's the word evolution you said, is that over time, as the uh, market processes, economic processes took place, uh, there was evolution where there were uh, started to become the emergence of dominant, very powerful corporations, interests called the trust. Now, it turns out we can see this today as well uh, uh, in, in all these industries that were started back in the 90s. You know, we can see it in software, we can see it in uh, uh, smartphones, we can see it in probably many of the core technologies. You know, they started out as being small entrepreneurial firms, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, and with lots and lots of competitors. We know that Steve Klepper and his work on industry evolution, you know, he, he maps this out in almost every industry, automobiles, um, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, uh, it, it starts small and dispersed, but once we start to get, I, I'm not gonna say winners, in a way, by their own success, they get more and more um, power from their own success. Then that that decision making starts to get centralized, and uh, and uh, we end up in a situation where we get this concentration of power. Now it can happen. Then once we have a concentration of power, this then starts to uh, challenge the core premise of a democratic process that says, you said it earlier, Yohan, everybody has voice and everybody has independence, but to the degree there's power, wealth, that's unequal, then we've got a problem. So I think Schumpeter recognized, Joseph Schumpeter, the great thinker, when he said, for capitalism to work, for society to survive, it needs creative destruction. It always needs those new voices coming in, that diversity that Johan talked about, to a challenge the status quo, start new uh, ideas, enterprises, ventures, be entrepreneurial, and this process has to be allowed. But my last point is, you know, if you look at say the case of China, um, uh, but the former Soviet Union, they say the US back in the late 1800s, we could see this. What stopped it or what was the check in the US? It wasn't just the uh, uh, the revolution for regulatory intervention by the federal government and by the antitrust statutes. But it was clear there was a societal concern. We've got a problem and it's a threat to democracy. So in a way, just as we've got to be proactive about our health, I think that societies, every place, have to be proactive to make sure it actually doesn't just passively sit by sit back and let entrepreneurship happen, but to make sure it keeps uh, educating, equipping, keeping the institutions, uh, encouraging entrepreneurship. Probably more little things, as uh, Tocqueville said, you know, two centuries ago, than just one big law or one big policy. But that's what kind of the backbone of an entrepreneurial culture. Uh, very, very interesting, David. It makes me think of uh, I think that our political system is probably more divided now than it's potentially ever been. But I think there, there, there's actually one issue where uh, there's agreement, and that is uh, this dominance that you talk about, the dominance of the large companies and the drawbacks of that and the need for us to make sure that we can uh, rein in the biggest companies and create more competition and make sure that we can get more, uh, more companies into these arenas. So I think there is at least some hope there that something might happen in the near future. You, you know, Johan, you remind me, our friend Roy Turek invited me to, uh, to speak at the then famous Echo Dock. I don't know if your Swedish helps you with Dutch. I went not so, which was basically a day of uh, economics in, in Holland a million years ago. And I, in a way, we were just discovering this issue of entrepreneurship back in the 80s. And so I kind of give this talk on the importance of uh, small business and startups entrepreneurship in the United States. 
and afterwards, this old kind of uh, 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 quite angry uh, uh, man gets up and he points his finger at me. And he goes, Mr. Audridge, what do you have against our great firm company Phillips? At, at that point, account for like 7% of the employment in, in, in Holland. And I didn't know what to say. Roy, though, intervenes and he goes, oh, he's not saying there's anything with, with Phillips. He just says we should grow more of them. And I think that's the point. I, yes, you know, the fact that Twitter, Facebook are now faced with this problem, what to do with a former president, it, it, you know, that shows power at a level that makes people uncomfortable, uh, to, as you said, on both sides. But the solution I think you and I think agree on is let's make sure we keep fueling the entrepreneurial process so we keep growing more enter the, the, the entrepreneurial firms of the next generation, right? It's a shame that we call it antitrust in this country. In, in Europe, they talk about competitive instead, yes. you know, having a, a comp uh, talk about competition. And I think that's what we're talking about, uh, allowing more, more people and more types of companies to come in to increase competition and, and just create more opportunities and more alternatives. You know, I, I, we'll get we'll, we'll let Tim get a word in here, but um, I remember it was uh, our friend Zoltan Ach said to me way back as Microsoft soft started to uh, split off from just being another small startup to being the powerhouse it is. And Zoltan said to me, you know, the miracle of the United States is that they didn't allow the dominant giant in the in the in the in the space the industry ibm to just wipe it out and there's something about the discipline the culture the but ultimately the laws the policies of you know western europe yeah the, uh, uh, you know the leading developed countries we permit these challenges that are actually going to lead to creative i mean that is creative destruction right and it's that, and I think Schumpeter implied that you've got to keep fueling it. You've got to keep feeding it like a fire. And if you just, you know, like a fire in your fireplace, if you just assume it's going to keep going, it'll burn out. And I think that's partly to explain why we've seen these declines, both in democracy and entrepreneurship in the West. Yeah, Johan. Yeah, so, so I'm going to actually ask you a question, if you don't mind, Tim. So you mentioned that I wish I could go back and, and revise my paper. And then I said, well, maybe you should write another paper. So my question is, so now you, you have kind of, you have opened up this idea that these, these are linked. You, you, have, you make some suggestions in your article. What do you see at, 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 as the potential next step? If there's somebody listening to this who's a, young academic thinking about doing research either in democracy or entrepreneurship. What do you think we should focus on when it comes yeah, to Yeah, you know, I, I can, I gave a, 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 it's a different paper. I gave a research seminar, seminar at Georgia Tech some years ago on a different topic. And uh, the host, uh, somebody uh, our age uh, uh, said afterwards, he goes, but David, you haven't proven anything. And I said, <laughs> yeah, you know, papers either, you said this before, Yohan, you know, either they finish debates, they prove something, or they start them. I'm more comfortable at my age in the, in the latter, right? So I think that, yeah, in fact, we need an army of scholars to go in and not just flesh out to prove it, but it's also more nuanced, you know? this this Is this relationship important at a regional level, even within organizations? You know, it, what's true of, or I think we feel this at universities, I'm not going to say uh, put words in Tim's mouth, but for all of our successes at, at you know uh, modern universities, as we grow and grow and grow, many of the colleagues feel like we're losing our voice, we're losing our ability to be involved. So we could see this at an organizational level. Certainly, we can see it at a spatial level, probably at an industry level. So that's one thing. It's just kind of more empirical. But I think the other is. Uh, one level is what does this mean for, I'll say for, um, uh, for the field of entrepreneurship itself? And you know, Johan, being uh, editor of the premier journal in the field, 
uh, 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 which is a, a tremendous accomplishment. But there's more and more colleagues, I think, I think we think, who think of entrepreneurship. They say, no, nah, no, nah, small business, no, that's not that. Uh, Self-employment, no, that's not. No, yeah, family business, no. What it is is this kind of Silicon Valley view that says we've got scale up, growth, exit strategy, great returns to the investors, and you know, radical innovation. I neither of us are against any of that. But when you think about that, is that what fuels the democratic process? It goes back to what you said before, that is in fact the challenge right now is to get inclusion of people and have them participating, it makes, I think there's a great opportunity in research to try to analyze and explain why uh, uh, independent businesses, owning businesses, why these different organizational forms generate value. It goes back to your point that says, don't just look on the economic, the typical metrics of growth, innovation, but look at the kind of social contr contribution, political contribution, the externalities, I guess, but they come back to the individuals in a way of, uh, uh, Tim and I were talking, this is what the new generation wants. They wanna feel involved. They wanna feel that they're shaping society in the right direction. So I think that I did that give enough of a research agenda for the next Absolutely 10 years. They did. Uh, <laughs> it, it, makes, it makes me very happy because I, I, I agree with this that, uh, and this is where I see the, the clear connection to entrepreneurship, excuse me, to democracy as, as well as you say, uh, you know, that this dimension of inclusion, that it is, I mean, we know that it is a problem in society that people are getting left behind. I mean, we know this, for example, with the, the, the development of artificial intelligence, there are some scenarios people paint where you know half of the people in, in this country will no longer be needed in, in the labor market. I'm not, say, I'm not saying that's what's gonna happen. I just know there are some pes very pessimistic scenarios. We also do know that there's a lot of young men in particular who are completely outside of the labor market. They neither go to university nor work and uh, uh, people talk about them sitting in their in their parents basements and uh, playing video games so uh, i absolutely agree that it's, it is this dimension of inclusion uh this kind of very fine grade micro uh, view of of entrepreneurship that i think is going to be important for for our democracy and you know tim knows this i mean tim and i share this uh we live in a a state that is uh, some elitist call a flyover state, right, Tim? And, yes, uh, I've heard that before, David, certainly. Yes. And, and you know what, the, the view of these people or this view says, you know, there's no, nothing going on, nothing of interest. And is, oh, by the way, Johan, for where you live in Syracuse, it's not a flyover state be, or flyover city because the weather's so bad. The planes can never oh, fly. Right? That's the first I've heard. <laughs> but you know, beautiful sunny but, day. Sun, you know, sun, and, and sun. the same kind of line of thinking says, and, you know, Johan, we might, I don't know, you hear this, we hear this. Oh, there are three or four entrepreneurial cities in the United States, you know, the Bay Area, San Diego, wherever else. And yeah, I see you shake your head because, in a way, that's writing off so much of the country. And I'm not going to argue that those places are not entrepreneurial, but I think that they're thinking of entrepreneurship in a very narrow and specific way, where if we think about more entrepreneurship the, provides a platform for people to reach inside themselves and then express their authenticity in a way that contributes, is valued in some ways by society, then we can see entrepreneurship flourish in a lot of different contexts and in a ways that may not generate the biggest, uh, uh, you know, scale up uh, uh, results or innovation or rates of return for exit strategies. But what you said, Johan and Tim and I, you know, we live in the belly of the beast. If we go outside yeah. Bloomington, you know, opioids addiction is a big problem, right? Why is that? You said it, Johan. There's a generation of younger people, especially young men, who feel they cannot participate. And they feel marginalized, excluded,
because you know what? They're not able to be part of this Silicon Valley model, not the least of which they don't live in Silicon Valley. But what we learn in entrepreneurship, there are these other kinds of modes, manifestations of, of entrepreneurship that used to be celebrated, having a small business, yeah. growing a small exactly. business, being a part of a community. And I think in our, our rush to create what we needed back in the 1980s, which we needed innovation, we needed growth, we succeeded. Now it's time to uh, start to turn our attention to these other problems that entrepreneurship can, I think, can be a leader in addressing, but it's a slightly different kind of entrepreneurship, yeah. No, but absolutely, I complete. I'm, I have two points there. Uh, one is, I mean, I, I think it's been been said by our current president many times, you know, about the problems with the big companies closing and, and, and leaving, in particular in the Midwest. And and I don't think anybody has a really good grips on on what's going to come instead. You know, one option, of, co of course, is, is is people leaving and moving elsewhere. But I mean. I don't think that's feasible. I don't think that's what we'd want in the long run to have a, a few mega cities in a completely empty center of our country. So <clears throat> I absolutely do agree that, that entrepreneurship in all its forms is, is an important part of the solution. And, and the beauty of entrepreneurship is that you never know exactly what's gonna come out of it. So I think it's, we, 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 it has to be something that grows from the bottom up rather than the other way around. So that's a one point. Uh, the other point is uh, there's a lot of talk now in, in both policy circles and academic circles about entrepreneurial ecosystems. And what that denotes is largely, you know, you have the entrepreneurs themselves, but then you also have people providing uh, financing. You have other, other uh, stakeholders, you know, maybe policymakers um, and so forth and um, various ki kinds of support. So, so, and uh, people are starting to realizing that you, you need many different components in this system for it to work. I think there, there, there's a, I have visited, you know, these kind of ecosystems around the world. I've been lucky enough to spend time both in Europe and Australia and America uh, and Southeast Asia over the past couple of years. And what's really striking about visiting these things is how similar they are. And the fact that they largely cater for the same kind of people, it's very much, you know, you see a lot of white or Asian young men, thin, riding bicycles and drinking coffee, <laughs> which, which is, a, if you think about it, is a very thin sliver of what the population really looks like. So I think it's really important when we have these initiatives, you know, uh, trying to, to, to strengthen and build these ecosystems. I think it's so important that these are diverse and inclusive and that we have all sorts of people getting access and feeling appreciated in these ecosystems because uh, it's both good for society and for the individuals. I think it's something we need. Boy, yo, do you mind, Tim, if I respond? Please, but I couldn't agree more, Johan. Thank you. Yeah, uh, well then, Tim, you can, here's a, here's a question for you, a challenge for you. Was it John Dunney or Don? Donnie who said, no man is an island. <laughs> I believe no so, David. Yeah, 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 centuries ago, right? And, you know, that's what Johan just said. No entrepreneur is an island. Uh, somebody else said it takes a village to raise a child, maybe. But it, Johan just said it takes a village to nourish a, a flourishing entrepreneurship. And, you know, I remember uh, being at a conference, Johan, from your, uh, uh, oh, by the way, Johan is known as the Johnny Cash of uh, entrepreneurship research. You know why, Tim? No. Because he's been everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was in Johan's very own uh, birth, country of birth, uh, Sweden, of course, in Stockholm at a conference of, you know, decades ago, really. And uh, one of the keynote speakers was, uh, 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 was uh, uh, somebody from the, uh, mayor's office of Cleveland, actually. And he asks to the audience, he asks, how many of you people here work for the government? And about a third of the people raise their hand. And then he asks, how many of people, how, how many of you work in academia? And about a third of us raise our hand. And then he asks, how many of you are in the private sector? And about a third of the people raise their hands. And then he says, congratulations, 
You're the ones who create the jobs. And uh, I'll never forget the guy next to me, some Swedish guy I didn't know, he whispers in my ear, he says, let's send those people to Siberia and see how many jobs they create. And you know, that's the point. It's easy to blame Johan, the journal editor, because they're the ones you should always blame. But that's why for most of my misery, I blame Johan and his colleagues, the journal editors. But you know, I think that as the field emerged, we tended to have this view of the entrepreneur as isolated, out of a context, and was a, a, a person who was, uh, you know, in a way it's the independence and autonomy, but it's kind of the other side of this, the free of context. But mm -hmm. as Johan just said, you know what, there's a reason why they go to Silicon Valley, why it flourishes, because they're gonna do well there and maybe not so well other places. So therefore it starts to become incumbent on a place that wants to solve its problem, whether it's Indiana or Syracuse or the north of Sweden, right? To figure out what can we do to help the people and the businesses in our state, in our place, to give them the tools, the, the, the skills they need so that they can be the kind of entrepreneurs that are congruent with the place they're in. And, you know, frankly, San Diego entrepreneurship is different than Silicon Valley entrepreneurship. It's different industries, different people, different culture based on different strengths. I'm not gonna argue which is better. Same thing if we look at entrepreneurship in, um, I don't know, in, in Randstad between, um, between Rotterdam and, and Amsterdam. It's entrepreneurship, it's successful. But in that sense, uh, yeah, it may take a village to raise a child, but each child is different. Each entrepreneurship is different. And, you know, Johan just talked about the similarity of the entrepreneurial ecosystems. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And yet each one has a different kind of strength, right? Johan and has a different kind yeah, of- I just think the problem is that, that largely these ecosystems tend to support the same kinds of individuals. And I think it's largely people like us, you know, with a university education, it's like, we might feel that other people with that same education are better suited and more, we can speak to them, it's, it's, it's easier to say, okay, why don't you move into this incubator, for example? Whereas people that are completely different that have maybe no education and have different socioeconomic background, we're much less prone, I think, to reach out to those people. And I think it's so important that we, that we actually do reach out to those people, those that uh, struggle in, in, you know, in today's society and with the changes we're going through. I mean, it's, I, I think, I mean, it, I, I just listened to somebody who's been doing a lot of um, uh, interviews with, with people around the country and he's talking about, there are so many people today in, in this country who feel alienated. They feel they're not, mm. society is not for them. They feel that they're kind of left behind. So I think it's, uh, I mean, and I do, I do believe entrepreneurship can be a very important vehicle to try and get these people to feel motivated and, and part of, of something positive because we all need, I mean, the day we don't feel that we're needed, the day we feel we don't contribute to society, I think that's a very, very sad day. So we need to try and, and get all these people on board and that we, not, we need, yeah, we, we need to look at outside of our own comfort zone Hmm. Um, you, you, <laughs> poor Tim, can't get a question, but but Johan, uh, you know Tim's and my colleague, Sammy Desai, don't you? Sure you do. Yeah, well, Sammy did her PhD, um, which was financed by, actually financed by the, the Pentagon. Uh, this, of course, this is some years back, right after the uh, 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 Iraqi, or kind of the invasion of Iraq back in the, I don't know, the, the towards the middle of the 2000s, I can't quite get the time right. I think that's right. But she went, I mean, she went to Iraq and uh, with a little team and they interviewed, uh, they went to different villages and they interviewed young males. And as I get this right, she basically, you know, she did a survey and she asked, well, if you could, if somebody would give you uh, say a hundred dollars to start a business, would you choose to be an entrepreneur or a terrorist? And you can see why the US oh, yeah. had an interest in that as a policy. And 
honestly, you'd have to ask her. I can't remember the results, but that's kind of your point, right? If people have no alternative, probably the results are not going to be good, whether it's terrorism, opioids, you use the word, Johan, yeah. right? Um, alienation. I love that mm -hmm. word because we know it almost doesn't matter where you live in this country. There's this generation of people who feel we're not participating. But you know, Johan, I'm just repeating Johan now. What you said, I think that's kind of the link between entrepreneurship and democracy, and in some ways, sustainability or stability of society, because through entrepreneurship, people can get a voice. They get to express what's in them and they get to manifest it in society. And in a way they feel in these kind of smaller towns, regions, certainly in, here in Indiana, they feel like they have a very, you know, uh, 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 unfortunate choice. Either they leave the towns, uh, the, 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 the families that the, 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 the they, they love, that they, this part of their identity, and then they go off to some big nameless city and do work that they feel like has no, you know, it's just uh, uh, kind of like, you know, they're alienated or they stay home in the place they love, that's where their values are, that's what they believe, but there's no opportunity. And, you know, either way they lose. I feel, and this is true all around the world, right? It's true in the North of Sweden. I know that, right, Johan? We see it in Germany, we see it in Italy, we see it in every country, developed country that I know. And it seems like what Johan's saying is that by harnessing the entrepreneurial spirit and capabilities of these people, because I guess a premise Johan has, and I have, is that you know almost everybody has the potential to be an entrepreneur. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Johan. It's just, we would be entrepreneurs doing different things. I would, my entrepreneurship, if I were an entrepreneur, you know what I would do? I would talk because that's all I can do, right? I find a way to talk. You can talk. write as well, David. You've written quite a few papers by now. <laughs> I'll talk and I'll write. That's, by the way, that's what you do too, Johan. But the point is, and now I get back to it, I think in our exuberance to get us out of the stagnation of the 1980s and 1970s, we, put our resources, our focus, our values in. Let's have this kind of uh, radical innovation. In fact, our policies like the Bayh-Dole Act, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, the funding for the federal agencies, it was great. And it actually addressed the problems of the country, which was massive unemployment stagnation. Now we have new problems and new challenges. And I think Johan and I believe Entrepreneurship is surely not the only solution, but it is a big potentially potential uh, 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 part of the solution that has not been addressed. Instead, what we hear a lot of policymakers and thought leaders like Johan say, not Johan, but other thought leaders say, you know what, get out of that kind of dead place, go to a big city. And, you know, Johan said it before, that's not going to be a solution. <laughs> Wow. Uh, I appreciate all that you two have been sharing today and lots of excellent thinking and uh, ideas for further research and discussion. You know, David, I love the quote from the article. You end with perhaps the contribution that entrepreneurship makes to underscore democracy is the most important case for policy and intervention of all. And so maybe that'd be a good uh, place for us to wrap this up because I'm hearing that in environments in which democracy and entrepreneurship look their best, instead of labeling the outcomes and, and trying to predict what will come out of it, set up the environment, right? And support the participants to get involved. And then instead of saying, oh, 50 years from now, measuring what made that generation great, we can say there were many greats that came out of that period. I like I the sound the of that. Of the whole thing. Yeah, that's right. See, leave, leave it to Tim, who's not in our business, Johan, to say it better than we could. <laughs> I'm trying to break into your business. How's that? <laughs> uh, well, our business is pretty broken sometimes. So that's... <laughs> Thank you, Tim, very much. And good to see you, Johan.
Oh, it's yeah. so great to talk to both of you. Thank you again. And uh, I look forward to our next discussion. Let's uh, let's continue. Thanks, Tim. Take care. Thanks. Bye, Take care. Bye, Tim. Bye-bye.